At the risk of oversimplifying, I have come to believe that there are two basic kinds of people in the world. There are people who follow instructions, and there are people who throw the instructions to the side. So I grew up in a home where my dad would open a package, and he would pull out the instruction manual, and he would toss it off to the side. I distinctly remember I was probably around the age of four or five. He did this on one occasion, and I said to him, like, Dad, what are these, and why are they in the package? And he said, ah, we don't need those. And so he would proceed to just try to put things together without the instruction. And then there's people that very diligently follow the instructions. I used to be the kind of person that didn't care much about the instruction manual until I was introduced into Ikea furniture. I I don't know uh, what is going on with Ikea furniture, but it's all those weird little people and, and they're like doing stuff with the package and you're like, I have no idea what I'm supposed to do. When I first started into ministry 20 years ago, the number one reason for divorce was financial issues. Now it's people putting together Ikea furniture. I I am thoroughly convinced. It will test your marriage like none other. And I point all this out because as a pastor in the local church and as a chaplain in the Air Force Reserves, I've started to see that what we do with instruction manuals can carry into how we treat the Word of God. When instruction manuals are optional to us, then the Bible can start to become optional to us as well. And part of this is tied to our preconceived notions. Many do not feel that the Bible is all that approachable. And and honestly, the big C church hasn't done a lot to help things out. It's fostered the mentality that the common person can't approach the Word of God. Throughout the Middle Ages that we now refer to as the Dark Ages, the Bible was kept in a language that was not spoken by the common people. Finally, in the 1500s, it was translated into English. But even then, it was... uh, Uh, the fact that most of the society was illiterate, and so they couldn't read the Word of God for themselves. And so it took on a shroud of mystery and a shroud of intimidation. And it's my hope over the next five weeks as we do this little series called Threads that we're able to look at the Bible and make it more approachable. We're going to stay really, really high level because what I believe is that the Bible is not 66 individual books with broken up thoughts moving in a million different directions. Instead, Scripture is written by one God who has a story to tell and has a goal. And so he weaves threads throughout Scripture that enable to... uh, help us to become who he has created us to be. Now, the reason this is important for our lives goes to a quote by the famous preacher Charles Spurgeon. He once said this, a Bible that's falling apart usually belongs to someone who isn't. When we get into the Word of God, when we have the Word of God in our lives, if if it's falling apart because we love Scripture and because we're, we're taking Scripture in, often it keeps our lives from falling apart. And I don't want your life to fall apart. I don't want my life to fall apart. So I'm going to try to help us approach the Bible and understand it a little bit better. Now, if somebody hands you a Bible and you open it up to page one, you enter into what's called the Pentateuch. The Pentateuch, or the Law, or the Torah, is made up of the first five books of the Bible. Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy. Pentateuch, simply put, means five books. And the Israelite people back then and the Israelite people today will refer to these five books as the Torah. Torah is simply a word that means law or can also be translated as instruction. Now, personally, this isn't a matter of right or wrong. It's a matter of personal preference. I usually just say the law or I will say the um, instructions. That's because I don't want to make it more confusing than it needs to be. I, I took three years of Hebrew. I took six years of Greek. And so I know the language that the Bible's written in, but I don't want to put a barrier up. I feel like it took the church 15 hundred years to get over the language barrier. So I usually don't use the Hebrew and the Greek words because I feel like it's kind of unnecessary. But but however you want to refer to it, the, the Torah, the Pentateuch, the law, the instructions, we're talking about the first five books of the Bible that were written by Moses, who was the first of the Old Testament prophets. At face value, 
These books are a mini-series. They tell us the story of God creating, of God choosing a people, and of God leading a people out of the place where they were, which was a place of slavery, and taking them to the promised land. It's a mini-series that begs for a sequel. It begs for a sequel because when we get to the end of the Torah, the first five books of the Bible, we, we are waiting, and we're anticipating, and we're asking, okay, are they going to get to go into the promised land or not? There's a lot in here. It covers 1,500 years of history, everything from creation to the flood, to the Tower of Babel, to the covenant, to the patriarchs, to the exodus, to the law, holiness, sacred space, and God himself. It's all packed into the first five books of the Bible. Now, often, those of us with good intentions will start reading the Bible, and we'll make it through Genesis 1 and 2, and we'll maybe even make it halfway through Genesis, but then we kind of grind to a halt. That's because it starts to get a little confusing. So what I want to do is, is really high level, tell you what each of the first five books of the Bible do, treat them like puzzle pieces, and then we'll snap them together whenever we get to the end. So let's start with Genesis. The purpose of Genesis is to begin the story of the covenant. Genesis tells us God created everything just right, but his people chose to sin. And so God made a promise. God made a covenant with his chosen people, Abraham and his descendants. And the promise is that he would show himself to the world by loving his people and giving them his presence. Now, throughout the establishment of the covenant, there's all kinds of obstacles. As we read Genesis, we find that it's God who's consistently the one taking the initiative. It's God who is consistently moving. It's God who takes a covenant with himself and gives the promise to Abraham. God doesn't have to do this, but he chooses to do this, and he overcomes the fault of people time and time again in order to show us his faithfulness. Now, there are lots of times when you read the book of Genesis where it seems like what God is trying to do with his people hangs by a fragile thread. That, that they're just not listening. They're not getting what is happening. But yet what God starts in the beginning, he continues to do in our lives today, and that's this. He finds himself with chaos, and God steps into the chaos, and he brings order out of the chaos. And he still does that. He still steps into our lives and gives us mercy and grace. And so what starts in Genesis continues in Exodus. The purpose of Exodus is to explain how God's presence came to be with his people. In Genesis, God chooses a people. He calls them the Israelites. And in Exodus, he calls them out of slavery. Now, they haven't been in slavery for just a few minutes. They've been in slavery for 400 years. They feel completely abandoned by God. They question whether or not God still loves them. And so God shows up through plagues and through deliverance. He shows them that he loves them, and he invites them to come with him out to a place of worship. The intended result is that the Israelites and the Egyptians alike will acknowledge who God is and will come to love God for who he is. And so at Sinai, God gives his law to his people to show them what he's all about. He makes it clear that he's going to reveal himself by being in their midst, which brings us to Leviticus. The purpose of Leviticus is to detail the management of sacred space, status, and time. Leviticus is where we tend to get lost. If we're reading through the first five books of the Bible, we can sometimes make it through Genesis and Exodus, but we get to Leviticus and we are often confused by all of the ritual that is happening. But what we find is that what God started back in Genesis, he is bringing to fruition in Leviticus. And that's this, that God is defeating chaos by ritual. God establishes the priests and he calls his people to live by a certain standard. And by living under this standard, they are able to defeat the chaos in their lives and be set apart as people who honor and follow God. And at the center of all this is the sacrificial system. And it's the people who are giving their sacrifices to God. Now, we can, we can really get lost, as I mentioned already, but God in all of this is bringing harmony in the midst of chaos because he's the one that loves the people. 
And he's the one that gives his presence to the people. And it's God in the book of Leviticus who puts his presence in the middle of the people in the form of a tabernacle. He tents, he camps, he gives himself to the people and he multiplies the people, which brings us to Numbers. The purpose of Numbers is to contrast the faithfulness of God with the rebellion of the Israelites. God keeps his promise. He multiplies the people. That's why when you read in the book of Numbers, there's all the numbers that show how God is faithful to the people. And yet the people continue to wander away from God. And so they end up in the desert. They end up testing God on every level possible. And yet God ends up being faithful on every level possible, including providing leaders to the people. And so Aaron and Moses and Joshua and the priests are given in order to maintain a sense of order even in the midst of chaos. But there is constantly the nagging rebellion of the people. They ignore the law, the instructions. They refuse to trust God. And it's an issue that persists until that first generation dies off. And now they're standing with their toes on the edge, ready to enter the promised land. And we come to the purpose of Deuteronomy. Deuteronomy is summarize, is to summarize and renew the covenant in order to prepare God's people for the promised land. It's the law, as we often think of it today, and it's all structured around the Ten Commandments. It's God's way of saying, this is who I am, and this is how you reflect who I am to the world around you. It places the emphasis on the existence of one God and one people and one sanctuary and one law. Deuteronomy forms a constitution that establishes the nation of Israel as they move into the promised land. And it reminds the people, hey, here's how God was faithful in the past, and here's how God will be faithful in your presence now. It puts the meat on the bones of the commandments of God. For 20 chapters, it's a legislative portfolio that tells us the implications, the nuances, the ramifications of the law. But if we don't understand it right, if we don't understand the law correctly, Correctly, we get off base right from the beginning. When we pick up our Bibles and we start in Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy, if, if we don't understand what's happening there, we get off course. I don't know why, but in the Air Force Reserves, they love to take us out in the woods and they love to drop us off and give us a compass and a bearing. And we're supposed to see if we can find the people at the edge, uh, wherever the bearing leads. What this exercise has taught me personally is that I'm not very good at reading a compass. And it's also taught me that if you get a little bit off in the beginning, you majorly end up in the wrong place at the end. That before you ever take this step, you better know where you're headed because if you're off just a couple of degrees here, that couple of degrees makes a really big difference when you get down there. And the same comes whenever we approach the Bible. If we don't understand what the law is doing, if we miss the point of it, it sets us in the wrong direction. And so when we pick up the New Testament of the Bible, we see that the New Testament writers are very clear about what the law can and cannot do. The law cannot provide grace for us. It was never intended to. The law cannot make us right with God. The law is best understood as a guide to knowing who God is. The law, according to the New Testament, was given as an act of grace to help us know who God is so that we can know what God is like. The law helps us to understand. The first five books of the Bible are where God reveals himself. To say it differently, if it were not for the Pentateuch, if it were not for the first five books of the Bible, we would not know who God is and what he's like. Which brings us back to the passage that Nicole read for us a few minutes ago. In Deuteronomy, God is summarizing his covenant with his people. They're getting ready to walk into the promised land. And we read these words. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. We, we wouldn't know this if it wasn't for the law. If it wasn't for what God has revealed to us about himself, we wouldn't know that he is one. And you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your might. And these words that I command you today shall be on your heart. You shall teach them diligently to your children. You shall talk of them when you sit in your house. 
and when you walk by the way, and when you lie down, and when you rise. You shall bind them as a sign on your hands, and they shall be as frontlets between your eyes. So literally, they would take the law, and they would write it on these tiny little scrolls, and they would hang it so that it was right between their eyes. The idea being that we want the law, we want who God is to guide where we're going in life. You shall write them on the doorposts of your house and on your gates. Wherever you go and whatever you do, who God is and what he's about and the standards he calls you to, they should be a part of your life. It should be around you at all times. It should be setting up a pattern for how you live your life. And notice, right at the beginning, God says God is one. The God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, the God of Jacob is one. This is really important for the Israelites to know because they're about to enter a promised land full of false gods. And today, as soon as church is over, you're going to walk out these doors into a world full of false gods. You're going to walk out these doors into a place where there's all kinds of other things you can place your trust in, and yet God reveals himself in a certain way that we are to trust him for who he is. There's a challenge for us to understand who God is, and there's a challenge for the parents in the room to teach this to our kids. That truth can be kind of scary. It can be scary because it feels complicated. Like, I don't even understand Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy. So how am I supposed to teach that to my kids? Well, the reality is that we teach our kids about who we think God is by the way we treat one another within the confines of our house. Whether we say anything or not, as a dad, the way I treat my kids, the way I react to my kids, the way I parent my kids, it shows them what I believe about God. By the way I love them and the way I offer mercy and the way I offer grace, it reveals, it shows my hand, this is what I believe about God. As a husband, the how I treat my wife shows her how I feel about God. It reveals my hand. It shows my cards as to what I think, as to who God is. So Jesus, he sums up the whole law like this. He boils the whole thing down. Everything you read there in Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy, all of it can be summed up like this. Love God and love your neighbor, Jesus says. And the Israelites said, hey, let's take this seriously, so let's have the law around us all the time. Parents, if you want to teach your kids to love God, if you want your children to follow God, then you must make following God a part of your everyday experience. That's all the scripture is saying. It's got to be a part of your everyday experience, straightforward, simple. If you want your children, your grandchildren, your spouse, your family, your friends, if you want your whoever it is to love God, to follow God, then you have to be loving and following God in the everyday of your life. This is what the early church called discipleship. They said, let's follow Jesus because he shows us how to be, uh, become like God, how to, how to move in a direction towards God. And so Paul comes along and he writes to the church in Corinth and he says, follow my example as I follow the example of Christ. The law, as is given to us, the instructions, they help us to understand who God is so that we can move in a direction to become more like God in the daily grind of our lives. A lot of this is tied to the idea of sacred space. I don't know how much you've ever thought about sacred space, but it's a big deal throughout the Old Testament. Now, there's a sense in which we might say, well, it doesn't matter in the New Testament because we're not under law, we're under grace. That's how we tend to think about it. But what we need to understand is that while the law gives us a map, Jesus becomes the guide. That doesn't mean the law doesn't matter. The author of Hebrews, he'll say it like this, though. He'll say these words. I think we have them here to put on the screen for you. There we go. He'll say, by calling this covenant new, he, God, has made the first one obsolete, and what is obsolete and outdated will soon disappear. So in other words, what's in the Old Testament is obsolete. That doesn't mean it was defective. What it means is that the law never tried to make us right with God. It simply showed us who God is. And I'm hitting on this because it's so easy to get confused. When we understand it, though, we start to understand that really what's important in those first five books of the Bible is to understand who God is, to understand what he is like and how he loves us and how we are to move forward. 
And as we start to look at it, we, we come away realizing that he established his presence and he established his presence with his people and he called his priests to be the ones that ministered in his presence and made sure that everybody was able to get into the presence of God. So then we come to the New Testament and Peter says we are now the royal priesthood. What does that mean? Well, New Testament scholar or Old Testament scholar John Walton says this. He says the church has now taken its position in the long tradition of priests as the one who upholds creation through their acts of worship and preservation of purity. In other words, we get to be priests by how we live our lives with the presence of God in our life. Then as we become pure, others are able to see God and to see what it looks like to worship God through how we live. What this means is that who you were created to be matters. That's what the law says. That's the thread of the law. Who you were created to be matters. And it matters to God. And it matters to the world around us that desperately needs to see the presence of God. God addresses our issue of brokenness in Jesus and calls us to live our life differently. So let me make this really, really, really practical as we come to the end of our message together If who we are created to be matters, then that means for our lives today that we need to keep the space pure. When you read the first five books of the Bible, you get the the details of the life of a priest. The priest had a lot to do when it came to purification and to cleansing. And there's a tendency to write all this off as obsolete, but it should help us to, to notice how much God cares about even seemingly small impurities. All of it's taken care of in Jesus, but that doesn't mean that we shouldn't care about the things in our life that are not honoring to God. We cannot allow sin to fester. There's a high call placed on our lives to pay attention to what is in our lives, and that's hard to do because we live in a very permissive society. You don't need me to tell you this, but accountability is at an all-time low. You do you is much more than a tagline. Everybody gets to go their own ways, and yet as priests... We are called to care about the purity of our lives. We do this by allowing the presence of God to fill our lives, by giving more of ourselves over to God and allowing him to be a part of every area of our lives. We maintain an environment and a routine of worship. So what does it look like? What's it look like for you to maintain an environment and a routine of worship? Well, the first five books of the law instructed the priests of how they were to do that every single day. Every day, they were supposed to go into the temple and they were to do certain things. And every week, they were to do certain things. And every year, they were to do certain things. So they had this calendar that they followed that brought the presence of God, that brought order into the chaos. And in the same way, when we do devotions and when we practice Sabbath and when we participate in annual celebrations like Christmas and Easter, we are bringing order into the chaos of our lives. There are some people who will practice the feasts that are listed in the book of Leviticus. You can do that if you want to do that. It's it's another way that we're, we're able to practice the presence of God in our lives and to be reminded that we can move in and out of that. That presence. Now, you have to be careful with this because there's very much a sense in which God's everywhere. God is in all places at all times. And yet, the tabernacle shows us that we can be more or less in the presence of God. And so, as priests, we're responsible to move into the presence of God. And as we do this, we will begin to monitor the status of the inhabitants of the sacred space. Folks, we need to take seriously our role as a gatekeeper. We need to take seriously our role, and that means we need to prevent the impure things from festering in our lives. Personally, it means we need to do some self-examination. Nobody regulated the priests except for the priests themselves. Jesus teaches us that this isn't about behavior modification. It's about allowing God to change our heart. Because the presence of God is in our heart, we start to give more of our heart to God, and he starts to make us more holy. If we understand the presence of God in our lives, it changes the way we live our life. Changes the stuff we watch on TV and the books we read. It changes the reels that we scroll through. It's not about restricting ourselves. It's about allowing more of our life 
to receive the presence of God that's already in our lives. It's about the sacred space. It's about the routines. And so as we approach the law, it can sometimes seem very, very confusing. It can sometimes seem difficult to understand. But I think the thread that we are meant to see is rather simple. The law reveals the character of God and invites us to live a life with rhythms that place God at the center of our lives. And so the question that we each have to ask ourselves is, what's the stuff in my life, the impurities that I'm allowing to exist that shouldn't be there? If God was worried about what was on a chair in the Old Testament, if God was concerned about the little bit of mold that was on the wall, then what are the things in my life that are impurities that I've just spent way too much time living with that I need to purify? How do I allow more of the presence of God to come into my life so that I can become more like God, so that I can display His presence to the world around me? Let's pray together. God, thank you. For the law. Thank you for caring for us enough to reveal for us who you are. We recognize as we approach the beginning of the Bible that you didn't have to show us who you were. You could have just created the world and tossed us into the world and never revealed to us anything about who you are, but you chose instead to invite us to be a part of creating order out of chaos, to bring your presence to be with your people. And so we thank you for your faithfulness to individuals. We thank you for loving us. We thank you for preparing us for eternity. And God, we ask you to provide us wisdom and help, you, uh, help us to allow you to be at the center of our home so that more and more people are drawn into your love. Thank you for loving us. And thank you for being willing to tabernacle, to tent, to dwell in our lives. May we take seriously our role to be priests as we share your presence and love with those around us. It's in the name of Jesus, our Savior, that we pray. Amen.